Hey, so how you doing? Great to see you. Thanks. I'm, I'm doing great. It's fun to be in D.C. I always, I'm always very inspired by the city. Yeah, so. it was, it's awesome. Great. It's, well, I love being here as a homeboy myself, so <laughs> I'm glad, glad to have you here. So first thing we want to really uh, talk about, when it comes to music and also the, your, your field of study, I'm being a professor of uh, political science, and I, and I think when we think about gender politics as well, which is a really deep focus of what you do in music, um, women haven't been represented well uh, in music uh, historically. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you reconcile that as a music fan, but also as a professor who studies the, the way, the machinations behind why women are represented the way they are in music? You know, it's interesting that, that you ask that because, um, you know, as you first asked me sort of what are my musical inspirations, you know, growing up. Yeah. You know, for me, I am the same age as hip hop, basically, right? I was born in 1973. And yeah. so the the music of, of hip hop and its changes over time, they're my biography, right? I just feel like, um, you know, whether it's Tribe or Rakim or, you know, or Cool J, you know, I mean, anybody, right? That, that music is the thing that is my childhood and my adolescence, my growing political consciousness even. Um, I, I probably came to a feminist self-understanding sort of much later, long after having already been uh, deeply exposed to and engaged with hip-hop and so I always have both kind of a, a critical eye back towards hip-hop but also such a such a kind of attachment to it that I could never fully reject it simply because it reproduces the sexism that's part of American life. Period. It's yes. always been misogyny present in the music but in hip-hop in particular I think it's, it's focused on almost with a laser focus it seems. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that hip hop gets the the the, uh, the stigma and also the laser focus that it does? Why is it under the microscope so heavily? You think? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, I, uh, often there's an assumption by people who are not part of the African American community that unity is the single most important part of Black life. That somehow we all think the same, we're all together, and we all should be together. They they sometimes can't see unless you're what Du Bois would have called behind the veil. When you're behind the veil, you know that there there have always been disagreements, arguments, you know, issues with patriarchy, with homophobia. I mean, that's part of the landscape of who we are. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that it's reflected in our music is not surprising. It's, it's part of our struggle, is working those issues out. But if you think, oh, aren't y'all all together? Don't you all have the same interests? Then suddenly it becomes quirky or interesting to you that there would be differences and disagreements. I think that's part of it. I certainly think the other part of it is African-American women are not historically silent. We have spoken up for ourselves. And so, yes, some of that critique comes from the outside, but some of it comes from us as well saying, okay, too short, now you've officially gone too far. Yes. You know, right. scantily clad is one thing and tip drill, you know, is, is something else. What does have you attach yourself to as a fan and also as a listener? Yeah, well, well, you know, I'm, I live in New Orleans, so yeah. obviously I have a deep appreciation for jazz. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an appreciation that came just with living in New Orleans. My parents have long been jazz listeners. And then this will this will crack you up. <laughs> um, my mom, who is a, a, a white woman from the early um, sort of 60s, 70s movement, that I think one could easily describe as hippie movements. Um, you know, she also brought me up on like, you know, blue-eyed soul, white folk music. Mm. So I do know every Janis Joplin song. <laughs> Which is great. Yeah, I love it too. <laughs> and they're, you know, they're all on my iPod and there are times yeah. when I will play them very loudly and my husband is like, what is happening <laughs> in my house at this moment? Right, right. Um, so, you know, it's funny how that, that music will sometimes really move me. Um, uh, as well, but you know, I, I also just remember as a kid um, loving Diana Ross and feeling like um, there was something about her diva presence. It wasn't her voice, it wasn't her music per se, it was something more about her presence that I found really um, compelling and striking. Could just give us uh, who would represent your musical instrumentation be, uh, then and now, if you could. Well, so my very favorite music, so I've talked a little bit about the hip-hop and the blue-eyed uh, folk music and all of that, but un undoubtedly my very favorite artist growing up was Stevie Wonder. The, the one voice that always um, will stop me in my tracks is, is Stevie Wonder. It's his music, his voice, his performance, and I think also just that one of the first political movements I ever felt like I was a part of was the push to get the Martin Luther King holiday, mm -hmm. and so obviously Stevie Wonder was very much at the front of that. It was part of why it was exciting to me that President Obama chose Stevie Wonder as as 
his music of the 2008 campaign, right? right? So Stevie Wonders would be the one I would pick then. Mm -hmm. But if if there's one person right now with whom I have a very public obsession, it is Beyonce. Um, I think anybody who watches the show knows that I have a bit of a Beyonce problem. <laughs> we try, you know, we do a lot of music on the show, uh, and we try to always make sure there's at least one Beyonce song, either going out or coming in. Um, part of it is my the same thing I loved about Diana Ross, it's her diva, it's her bigness. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is about how she plays with um, musical history and with dance history. So, you know, for me, part of my adoration of Beyonce is her music, but part of it is also the videos and the ways that she uses dance in this kind of communicative, long story, all the way back to Africa, but then, then also though, and, and both sort of our imagined notion of Africa, but also like historic, West African dance, but also like um, queer politics and dance yes. and bringing in Jay setting and right. um, and then but then also Bob Fosse and you know and classical movements and the fact that she integrates all of them without it's not like she puts them in your face they're just there and they somehow feel like they organically go together but in fact they're very it feels to me like they're very purposeful so I, I love Beyonce and um, I, I'm dying for her to be <laughs> well, let's hope it happens sooner or later. I, I'm a big fan as well. Now, yeah, I say, and I and I wonder again too. This is also speaking very closely to your, uh, at what you teach as a professor at, at Tulane, and um, uh, and just how, and just also what you discuss on the show as well. Um, Beyonce exists in a world where it still is a male-dominated industry. It, it is very much uh, patriarchal in a sense, mm -hmm. um, but yet Beyonce remains as one of those few women whose voice presence and, and everything else about her attracts the attention of all, yeah. regardless of race, color, creed, or, or, or gender. Yep. Everyone looks at her with the same sort of, uh, it's almost all I would say. Mm -hmm. Even those who don't like her, yes. they still, they're compelled to, to address her in some way. You what can't do, ignore her. What, what, do you, what do you make of that? I, I, what, what, what does that come from, uh, if you can speak mm -hmm. to that, just, just as an observer? It's interesting. I mean, part of it is the um, the thing that you know. Obviously, all producers are looking for in an artist, which is that it factor yes, that, that yes. you can't you know you sort of can't even put your finger on. Mm -hmm. It's not that she has the single strongest voice that's out there. It's not that, but there's something about the whole package of things, um, both how she looks, how she self presents. Um, what her voice sounds like, what her articulation is, her willingness to play with all of these different ideas. Um, so all of that is a bit of an it factor. But then there's also a very self-conscious set of business decision that, decisions that she makes. And I don't think we, should, we would ever want to eliminate those because it's not just about being an artist. It's also about the choices that she makes about going from a group to going to, a, um, to an individual career and then her connection with Jay-Z, which is obviously a romantic and love one, yeah. but is also one that helps to build both of their brands and their business. And they do it in a very self-conscious and very careful way way that's kind of protecting their private life while still building their brand. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot that we can learn from Beyonce as the businesswoman as well. In fact, if she comes on the show, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, because I'm interested in how we, we have a self-conscious awareness about that, about Jay, mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily talk about it when we talk about Beyonce. Exactly.